Welcome everybody. My name is Kevin Kroos. I'm a coronary interventional physician in Boston, Massachusetts. We're excited to be here today to talk about IVL and really in particular image guided plaque modification, which is something that I've become passionate about over the past several years because I believe without question, it helps me to do a better job in terms of treating complex patients and getting optimized stenting results. These are my disclosures. And so I think, you know, as we talk, start to talk about complex PC optimization, uh, and what constitutes a chip patient. Lots of things go into defining chip and there's sort of a ongoing conversation about making this definition a little bit more consensus-based and clear. But one of the things that's always a part of the conversation with chip is that anatomy for these patients tends to be challenging. Things like CTOs, calcification, lung lesions, osteolesions. And these are the same patients that as a chip operator, we knew every feature of these regional characteristics put people at risk for Mason stent failure. So chip patients have a problem with PCI durability. So we've started to think long and hard about if we're going to take these patients, not refer them for bypass surgery, how can we work to try to approximate results that are to give them bypass surgery like uh, longevity so we can do things like compete with the LEMA. And as you're probably familiar, a study called Syntax2, which looked in the single arm way of best practice, imaging, physiology guidance, real CTO technique where you get durable CTO results at a high level are able to start to get us values of longevity and MACE freedom, which really, really look good compared to the old way of doing things. So with this in mind, as we think about the prevalence and difficulty of treating patients and have coronary calcium, we know several things. If you look in older series with IVIS, which clearly look at the ability to detect calcium based on the angiogram versus using intravascular imaging, the angiogram and fluoroscopy woefully underestimate the severity and prevalence of calcium. And so we don't really see this using usual tools. So thinking about how to apply intravascular imaging, potentially you can detect more calcium. And we know that calcium does things like reducing the durability of our intervention because it's difficult to get lesions to expand and we see problems with stent under expansion and stent asymmetry. And so if we think about identifying calcium, knowing that it's a problem, we could potentially bring algorithmic approaches to modifying calcium to get more durable stenting. And that's really the focus of what we're gonna talk about through these series of slides and cases. So we know that calcium inhibits PC optimization that drives MACE. Based on whether you're looking at older generation or newer generation stents, even with new generation technologies for DES, calcium patients do worse from a long-term outcome standpoint. And one of the things which typically confuses me when I understand how we're using interventional tools is even in cases where patients have severe calcium, atherectomy is used less than 35% of the time. If you look at hospitals in the U.S., a significant proportion of them have no atherectomy currently. They don't have any advanced plaque modification tools, but they're still treating calcified patients. And so thinking of ways and new technologies which can broaden the use of plaque modification potentially can help us with durability of PCI procedures. So if you think about PCI durability, we know this is an OCT study. Everything in red is an angiographic imaging feature, which is associated with bad outcomes. And the thing that drives MACE mostly in patients is small stents. Stent expansion and large stents is really paramount to getting good results for patients. The other things we care about are inlet and outlet disease. That's why it's part of modern image guided workflows. We recommend when possible stenting normal to normal. And there is, there really is a hazard to distal edge dissections, which if they're large and involve the media, they should be covered with a, with a, with a stent. This data and data like it from the IVIS literature are really nice because to take a football analogy, they really get us to the goal line of what constitutes an image optimized PCI. Large stents cover inflow and outflow disease and make sure you don't have a distal edge dissection. We used to think long and hard about malapposition of the problem and actually in a well-opposed stent, malapposition is not nearly as hazardous from MACE standpoint as we once thought it was. And so that's the nice thing about interventional cardiology over time with data, we start to evolve our understanding of how things are impacting patient durability. So one of the things which we also are fairly passionate about is trying to reduce stent failure because as a very busy brachytherapy referral center for people that have multiple layers of stents for whom there's no other options, we're seeing a lot of these patients. And it really is because 12% of all US PCIs are now done for instant restenosis. This is about 100,000 cases per year. It's a significant cost to the healthcare system. And it's a significant hazard to these patients. The studies that have come out even recently shown that TLR from stent failure has the highest mortality following PCI. So common, expensive, it kills people. And so I think it's trying to make these, these stents more durable for patients is really where the money is at in terms of long-term results for patients. 
And as we look at most of the data in terms of stenting outcome, many of the studies stop at one year. Some more recent ones have gone out to four and five years, but as patients live longer with these devices, thinking about the long-term hazard of continuing accrual of ISR and how to prevent that, it becomes an important part of how we should be responsibly doing revas for patients with PCI. So if you look at under expansion as a cause of stent failure, this is a really nice paper from the CRF group from about three years ago. Regardless of whether a stent fails under a year or greater than a year, everything under the red line is under expansion. And you can see that under expansion plays an important part in stent failure. This is usually an implant problem. Under expansion can be addressed by identifying calcium, modifying and getting the stent to expand well. If you look at patients that are referred to us for brachytherapy with two layers of stent, people don't want to put a third in because that starts to crowd the lumen with metal. This is a study which we published, or I should say presented at TCP last year, which is just really simple. If someone sent to us for multi-layer ISR for brachy, we just looked at the stent struts to see how well they were expanded relative to the reference segment. We found that 73% of patients coming to us with brachytherapy have under expansion defined as a stent which is expanded less than 80%. We really want to see stents expanded to 90%. So we set the bar pretty low. Even if you set it at 80, 73% of the patients have under expansion. So this is an implant problem, which could have been remediated with the first stent, the second stent. And so we see people, unfortunately, putting second stents into underexpanded stents. So we have multi-layers, which are pretty difficult to treat. We know that intravascular imaging improves PCI outcomes without question. Two randomized trials done two years apart on separate continents give us the exact same answer. Intravascular imaging cuts stent failure in half. This is IVUS XPL, which is a moderately complex lesion subset defined as 28 millimeters or, or longer. And ultimate was an all comer study done in Asia. Two separate studies, two separate continents, exact same answer. Imaging cuts stent failure in half. And there's been many meta-analyses which actually show a mortality benefit to intravascular imaging in terms of guiding PCI. So the data is here to really justify broad use of imaging and supporting PCI patients. How does this happen when we use imaging? This is a meta-analysis which just looks very simply at minimal luminal area of the lesion after treatment, image guided versus not. And we see that imaging makes our stents bigger. We know the bigger stents do better for patients. If imaging makes stents bigger, we know there's clearly an associated mechanism in terms of how this is happening. So with that in mind, I think being all in on image guided PCI as a path to PCI durability, there's been several algorithms developed around how to apply imaging to calcify lesions to get more durable results for patients. This is one that I like, and it's really the crux of where decision is made is whether it's balloon crossable or uncrossable. If it's a balloon crossable lesion, you can readily start to th do things like applying shockwave and intravascular lithotripsy or orbital or roto. If it's balloon uncrossable, obviously IVL is not yet an option, and therefore we have to think of making a channel with one of the mechanical atherectin devices and either using those primarily or doing things like orbit, tripsy, or rhodotripsy, or even laser tripsy, which we have a lot of experience with. And if time allows, I'll share some cases. And really looking to see whether or not there's fracture present on OCT and IVIS is what we do with the mechanical atherectomy devices. But one of the cool things is an OCT sub-study from uh, Disrupt CAD3 shows that you really don't even need to see those fractures with IVL, probably because there's microfractures which still allow the stent to expand. And I have a slide on that in a little bit. The idea here is you're really working to get modification of the compliance of the calcified lesion to get your stent to expand well. And the cool thing about an image guided PCI strategy is we always do a final imaging run to make sure that we've gotten good expansion. In the times where I've licked my wounds and not gotten that, it allows me to go back and say, all right, what did I do wrong here from a quality perspective, which helps me to evolve as an interventionist and get it right the next time. Once the stent is in, as everyone knows, it's really hard to get the stent to re-expand unless you start doing post-hoc stuff like laser, laser off-label on contrast, or IVL inside a stent, which is also off label currently. Intravascular imaging, we talked about the sensitive for detection of calcium. We don't have time today to kind of go into all the galleries of how you see calcium on IVIS versus OCT. OCT does have a little bit of benefit over IVIS in some cases because you can measure the thickness of calcium. This is what calcium looks like by OCT, a dark spot in the artery wall with well-defined margins. That's what uh, calcium looks like by IVIS, which I think most interventionists are well-versed at detecting. This is what a calcific nodule looks like. These are particularly noxious, as we talked about. They tend to deform stents and leave us to a place where our flow area looks very uh, abnormal from a geometry standpoint. 
And one of the nice things about concentric calcium is with OCT, you're able to measure it because OCT could see the full thickness. Conversely, with IVIS, you can only see the proximal ring and determining thickness can be a little bit tough. This difference in the technologies in terms of detecting calcium is important because they're really lazy into some of the uh, scoring systems we use for calcium to decide when that's vessel prep is needed, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So thinking of thickness of calcium, measurable by OCT, not readily measurable by, by IVIS. If you think about when we're going to decide to use advanced vessel preparation, shockwave or atherectomy, this is something as a complex PCI educator I often struggle with, because even in our own practice, there is a bell curve of some of us being readily likely to apply atherectomy with people being less likely, even in my same practice. And anytime there's heterogeneity in medicine, that's an opportunity for improvement, an opportunity to get better. This is a paper which came out from the CRF group a couple of years ago. And I have to say, by the time our interventional fellows get to June, they're tired of hearing me talk about this because as we do image guided PCI, the cadence of every case is what is the calcium volume index, which is integrating thickness of calcium, length of calcium, and how much of the vessel arc is calcified. And it's just a simple scoring system. At the point based on this scale, angle of calcium, thickness, and length, you're going to get to a place where in many cases you have a CVI score of three or four at which point we start to see that without, without advanced vessel prep, our stent expansion starts to fall off. And so as we start to kind of bring some common practice to what constitutes a plaque modification lesion, either by shockwave or by atherectomy, we can start to have an intelligent conversation about how these features of calcium impact something we should care about, which is stent expansion. So it's been a really nice evolution in terms of being able, at least for me as a complex PC operator, to have an intelligent conversation of what is actionable calcium based on the scoring system that matters for something that I really care about, which is how well expanded my stents are. We didn't really have great data on this for IVIS until two weeks ago when Gary Mint, Ziada Lee, and Akiko published this very nice paper in CCI. What this is, it's the very similar system. IVIS calcium score, scoring system as outlined here based on ARC, nodule, vessel diameter. And at the point where you get to two, three, or four, you should consider atherectomy because in a very similar way, they've shown that stent expansion starts to fall off. So now, regardless of whether you're an IVIS user or an OCT user, we could have an intelligent conversation about what constitutes modifiable or need to be modified calcium if you care about stent expansion, which I would argue we all should. So thinking about right, this right now, for OCT in particular, and this is often applied to IVIS now, we and several other colleagues got together about a year ago in Boston to try and build prescriptive imaging strategies on how to guide a PCI. What we came up with is this little acronym and workflow called MLD Max. It's prescriptive PCI optimization strategy, really walking through in a very simple paint by number way, how to do an image guided PCI. Cause we realized many of us were teaching this and doing this differently in the field needed consistency. So all MLD Max is in your pre PCI, you look at the morphology of the lesion based on the scoring system that I just showed you, determine length, trying to stent normal to normal whenever possible, and choosing the diameter of the stent based on the distal reference segment. This is really quick and easy to do. After you've determined whether you need to plaque modify, how long the stent is, how big it is, you put it in, you post dilate it immediately. I don't need to take another picture. And then I do a final OCT run to see how I did in terms of whether the stent is optimized. Understanding that the MSA expansion goal is acceptable if it's 80%, but we really want to try to get to 90. And there's some ways in which the workflow allow you to take a one-to-one -one size NC balloon to a minimum of 18 atmospheres. And if you go up on that and you're below 80%, it's okay. We don't want to advocate people start doing uh, aggressive stuff that's going to lead to perforation. I will tell you in calcified lesion through experience, and we're going to get data on this from an ongoing trial called the Lumine 4. We're going to see that it can be often hard to get to 90% of the calcified lesions, but we really want to do try to try to get to 80 because if you're at 80% expanded with the minimal stent area relative to the reference segments, that's when freedom from May starts to really be um, present for patients that are undergoing PCI. So if we looked at how MLD Max behaves in everyday practice in a project called Light Lab, which is ongoing, that we've had a large part in our set through. This has been done in 12 hospitals with 40 operators. And all Light Lab did in its first phase was to ask a simple question. 40 physicians are going to plan their case based on the angiogram. They're going to do a pre-PCI OCT, a post-PCI OCT, and see how that changed decision-making across what you would do based on the angiogram versus what you would do based on intravascular imaging. And amazingly, 
using intravascular imaging changed diagnosis and decision making 88% of the time. And things that really matter, like what type of lesion, what our vessel prep's gonna be, the stent diameter, and dealing with under expansion on the back end. And the cool part about this is if you actually plan the case with imaging, most of the impact of imaging comes in the planning with less work on the back end. And so this is a difference between an IVIS or OCT endorsed case versus one where you actually prescriptively plan it based on MLD and then modifying whether or not you optimize based on the MAX criteria. And so we were kind of cool, excited by this cool data because it really furthered the idea that this could be done in a way in multiple centers applied to difficult lesions in a very prescriptive and simple way. So this is showing what happens when the OCT detected calcium and the angiogram did. It led to a change in vessel preparation strategy 47% of the time. This was not done for the most part in era we had IVL, although there was some use of off-label peripheral IVL in the coronary that we won't belabor for this. But most of the time with the change in vessel prep led to escalation in predilation with cutting or scoring balloons or to escalation with atherectomy laser. So the imaging data made a difference in terms of what we were decided to do with regard to vessel prep. This is a poster from Light Lab from the third phase of it, which is presented at this meeting. So you know, hey, I've got a busy practice. I want to get home in time to see my kid's soccer game. All this OCT stuff that Kroos is advocating for is too complicated and going to take too long. It's not for me. I challenge that because new data from Light Lab shows that it takes an entirety of nine extra minutes to do a pre-PCI OCT and a post-PCI OCT, two runs to make sure that your case is optimized. And so if you're stenting my mom's LED, I would ask that nine minutes of careful attention to detail is certainly worth it so that she can get a well-expanded stent and be free from macio in the long term. And so the nice thing about Light Lab is we built a prescriptive strategy. We have clear data on when to do vessel prep and we show now that it doesn't take very long. And if you use MLD Max, I don't have the data in this deck because I wanted to be brief. Effectively, you use less stents because you can plan appropriately and have less trouble dealing with edge dissections, et cetera. And you don't increase contrast used in any appreciable way. And so it's been pretty nice because it shows the practicality of this application and real world patients, 12 hospitals, 40 operators. So with that in mind, if you think about the OCT and the value of calcium as it applies to shockwave, one of the things which I was surprised by is for a lot of times in my practice, if I saw fracture calcium, I knew it was time to stent. That premise does not apply to shockwave as much because in the OCT arm of CAD3, regardless of whether the OCT found calcium or not, your stent expansion was the same. And this is really cool. If you look at the timing of the case, if you're doing OCT, it didn't take any longer. So I think this further supports the practicality of image-guided PCI of an eye toward M, morphology, and how you're going to prep the vessel. So with that in mind, I've got a series of cases we can go through which sort of show image-guided PCI with regard to understanding decision making around vessel prep, but I wanted to see if there's any questions before that. Super. We're glad to have two of our chip fellows with us in this presentation who will remember some of these cases because they're hot off the presses from even the past couple weeks. So this is an 84 year old gentleman, post cabbage, class three engine, a low EF, occluded lima and vein graft, and he's status post the left main and LED PCI. We're still having angina, so we had a stage target of this RCCTO. RCCTO dual injections, there's the lesion, you can see nice collateralization from the left side. For us, this is not that difficult to CTO, it's a three, but it had been retried, not tried very hard. It ended up being very nicely simple anti-grade wire escalation case. This is the Gaia wire, which entered in the true lumen that got through some calcium there. And so at this point we're thinking, all right, this isn't gonna be very challenging, we'll dilate image and see what's going on. Our pre-dilation with an NC balloon was unexpandable in multiple areas, as you can see here. And then this is what the OCT shows. Applying that calcium volume index, the calcium is thick, it's long, and it constitutes more than 360 degrees. The CVI here is four. In this particular case, we did orbital atherectomy to try to prep the vessel because we were having a hard time delivering balloons down and the balloons were expanding. 18 runs of orbital atherectomy are shown here. Most of them on low through this long segment. The reason we did 18 is because there was a long segment of the tree. We try to be limited with the duration of runs to keep it under 15 seconds, because that tends to help with uh, regard to not having bradycardia and not having no reflow. You can see that after the orbital atherectomy, our NC balloons remained unexpandable. We took a three millimeter shock wave in and very nicely over the series of pulses distal and a three five millimeter shock wave proximal, we were able to get reasonable expansion. In this particular example, we did our OCT guided stenting based on the size. 
placing a series of overlapping DES, and got very nice expansion through an artery which, despite ET runs of orbital, remained unexpandable. This is the cadence of how we are able to prep the vessel to enable delivery of IVL in scenarios where a lot of orbital atherectomy had not yet modified it. And so I think this hybrid strategy to facilitate delivery is very helpful. The calcium signature that you saw through the mid and proximal vessel was really, really thick. It was more than one millimeter. And I can tell you from experience, it's going to take a ton of atherectomy over a long segment to get that done. Despite the fact that we used two IVL balloons, it was because there was so much calcium in this distal segment and there was a size discordance. So this is a fairly complicated CTO where we were able to get very nice stent expansion tapering over the course of it. It's a big RCA and the patient felt much, much better after treatment. So another case that's here, this is one which we did recently, 73 year old male, class three, four angina, CAD, CHF, had peripheral arterial disease with an iliac stent and a patch repair on the right side. EF is only 25%, creatinine is 1.2, so relatively high risk case. This is the angiograms which were sent to us from the referral hospital, less dominant, lots of disease in the circumflex, circumflex CTO, LED CTO, less dominant, amazing he was still alive. And sort of which arteries open, the answer in this case is none right now. And this is something that we're hoping to remediate. The LED CTO is shown there. This is a small right coronary artery, which is not large enough to consider revascularizing. He was a surgeon turned out for car targets. His pet showed global viability. We planned a complex PCI. His hemodynamics were not great. The cardiac index, the cardiac index was two with a wedge pressure of 26. So in this type of case, this is something which we're looking to do with mechanical circulatory support, particularly with an impella. We did a radio to peripheral angio to map out access for an impella. This is a patch angioplasty repair site with an iliac stent. This is sort of hard to get an impella through, and these are difficult to close. So we were looking to get an impella in through this side, which is relatively challenging because there's a significant calcified stenosis there. We were unable to deliver the impella sheath, not surprisingly. We took a seven millimeter shock wave, prepped the access site, and eventually we're able to deliver our impella quite nicely after doing the shock wave. And the nice thing about this is if you can get the impella sheath in, even a little bit, that ended up being our interventional sheath for the shockwave. So 14 French impella producer, enough in the hole, seven millimeter shockwave. We use all the pulses through that segment. The impella goes in and we're off to the races to start to treat the patient. In this particular example, we use something called single access where we use the access sheath for the impella to also be the access for our guide. So we put a seven French guide up through the single hole that was facilitated by the shockwave. Our diagnostic angiogram demonstrated the circumflex was worse the stenosis was more than it was even on the prior uh, pictures that we had. And you can see here that initially when we went to wire, the AV groove continuation, we were subminimal. This is the polymer jacket and the CTO wire. We eventually redirected it and were able to get it into the true lumen. In this particular example, we started to dilate and saw that our balloons were constricted in multiple places. Intravascular imaging showed that we had 360 degrees of calcium through this entire segment. And for us, this is a scenario where taking orbital atherectomy or roto is going to add hemodynamic stress to the patient, both from the process of doing the atherectomy and the distal embolization. And the person who's got an impella in there with an EF of 25% and decompensated hemodynamics, there really is an advantage, I think, to using a non-mechanical atherectomy to treat these patients. We did shockwave through this entire segment. And as you can see over the cadence of this, eventually got excellent expansion of NC balloons. With that in mind, this is the angiogram after stenting distally. We then started to work on this OM1 CTO, which was the second CTO in this territory. We were able to get into the lumen of it. And after two millimeter balloon angioplasty, we were hoping that this target would have grown, but it actually remained quite small. And so if this is a two five stent, I wasn't comfortable stenting this. So we left this with a balloon angioplasty only result. This is what the final angiogram looked like at the end of this case from here to here and leaving a POBA in the OM1, we're able very nicely to get the impella out. And so we brought him back 18 days later for an LED CTO PCI, which our current fellow Lindsay helped with, which was pretty recent. The right radial artery was occluded. The left radial artery was not compatible with a seven French system because of spasm. So we had to go back in to the left femoral artery place where we had actually shocked wave. And it looked great. The shock wave result we had from two weeks prior was excellent. And the target here is going to be the LED CTO. And you can see it's included. The visualization is quite poor. So this is going to be a relatively tough CTO because of the poor visualization and the amount of calcium there. Eventually, we were able to use something called a mini star technique, a Mongo, which was subminimal. 
popped into the lumen, you can see it compress and accelerate. We got a little bit lucky there because this may have needed ADR with a stingray, but it entered luminally quite easily. With that in mind, we did ballooning. I just again showed 360 degrees of calcium. And this poor patient, uh, despite his disease, should now be a poster child for IVL because we were able to IVL his leg, his circ, and now his proximal eight LED, being able to open this again without having to submit him to the stress of mechanical atherectomy. 3.5 shockwave expanded quite nicely. We did an IVIS guided reconstruction of his left main and his LED with overlapping DES. It got an excellent final result in terms of expansion, both in the LED and in the left main, pulsed out in the left main to eventually over four millimeters to post highly based on the IVIS optimization. This is really cool because your question earlier, we had really nice round circles after all that shock waving. And so I think I chose this case because it really represents nicely shock wave as a way to facilitate MCS. Shock wave is a way to facilitate not doing mechanical atherectomy in a patient had reduced LV function and marginal hemodynamics. And we did this actually electively and he went home a day and a half later. And so by summary, in terms of an image guided plaque modification, calcium reduces stent expansion and worsens PCI durability. Modern image guided workflows to assess calcium and guide vessel preparation help us to optimize our stenting results. Imaging impacts procedural decision making, it allows us to see calcium we can't see on the angiogram and change our vessel preparation strategy. This is data from Light Lab, and it only takes nine minutes. And IVL obviously facilitates calcium modification to help out my stent expansion. So I really appreciate the opportunity to present today. Uh, thanks for allowing us to use this technology and having me as part of this program. Happy to answer any questions. So yeah, so the question is best practices, best practices to use shockwave to get optimal outcome. Well, the first one is image, right? And so if you can see that there's calcium there, how long it is, where it is. A lot of times you, you may have a mid-right calcified lesion and underappreciate that there's other 50, 60% diameter stenosis that you don't see as much angiographically that won't respond to balloon inflation. And so there's been times in my life where when I didn't use imaging, I dealt with the tight lesion with atherectomy, ignore what's proximal or distal, my stent goes in and it's actually underexpanded in a place I didn't expect it to be. So I think a good survey of the entire target area for stenting is helpful. Um, understanding sizing of the artery, you know, I could show you data from Light Lab, either my personal data or the entire investigator base about the number of times that we as angiographers look at the vessel and say it's a 3-0 and get it wrong. For me, in terms of choosing diameter or choosing stent length, I get it wrong 70% of the time based on what I decide to do based on the OCT. So best practice is how big is the artery, right? Because we know with the shockwave device, if it's undersized, it may not work as well. So having it a little more than one-to-one -one has been my practice. And I can't tell one-to-one -one based on the angiogram, I tell based on the IVUS or based on the OCT. But you know, there's been cases with super calcified lesions, we may be at 74%, 73%. And that scenario, and this is a derivative of a Lumion 4, where I think taking oversized balloons to 26 atmospheres to remediate a stent which is 74, trying to get it to 80, potentially is hazardous. And so the workflow there is very simple. If you've identified with imaging what one-to-one -one sizing is, and you've taken a one-to-one -one size NC balloon, and you bring it up to 18 atmospheres, you leave it there for 30 seconds, that's the workflow that we've implemented in the clinical trials to make sure that people don't do things that are gonna rupture the vessel. I think, you know, what happens a lot of times with these calcified arteries, as I showed from our brachy data, is 80% is even not part of the conversation. It's usually 50, 60, 70. So if we're in the 74% range and I've done everything I can from a best practice standpoint to modify it and post out it, I will leave it alone and not go crazy. But I will self-critically look back at all the decision-making I made before I put that stent in to wonder, should I have prepped it differently? Should I have prepped it more? Should I have used more shockwave pulses or should I have thought about a mechanical atherectomy system you know, with, with shockwave? And so I think the nice thing about imaging is it keeps you honest and it allows you to check your work with regard to all the little micro decisions that got you to the place where you're doing your final imaging. And so it's a way to get better. If you're not doing the quality work you want to, then you think about what you would do differently in the same situation. I'm not taking NC balloons into 24 atmospheres in de novo lesions to prep them over before stanty because when it releases, it releases violently. I would way much more have a roto, an orbital or an IVL there to shave the calcium, or the IVL to modify the compliance to release in a way which is more deliberate, less focal and gentler. And so, you know, if I take, a, uh, if I do, you know, even, even in the scenario where maybe this CVI is three, it's kind of a borderline one, 
I'm not sure if it's going to need IVL or atherectomy, and I'm going to test it with a balloon. The imaging is important because I know what one-to-one -one balloon sizing is. A lot of times when I've seen people get into trouble with acute stent regret, put a stent in, doesn't expand, is because they take a 3.0 NC balloon to prep it in a 3.5 or 3.75 artery. Yep, balloon went up okay. It went up okay until so you put the stent in, the stent expands everywhere else except for the lesion. And so with that in mind, if there's ever any question about whether I've achieved adequate vessel prep, that one-to-one -one size balloon, if it goes to 18 and has a waist on it, I know I need to do more. What I typically don't do in that scenario is go to 24 or 26 atmospheres, which I will do in side stents, especially in underexpanded ones all the time. But when that happens, it often releases in a way which is much more violent to your point. And so if you're able to change compliance and get it to release in a way which is more measured, gradual, and not focal, I think it reduces risk of perforation. And so, you know, how you're assessing whether or not it's time to stent, we use calcium fracture for roto and orbital. We don't use it for IVL because the data shows it doesn't predict now, which is really cool. That's something I sort of had to wrap my head around. And there's, there's research data which Shockwave has been able to show to us, which shows that even when you don't see macro fracture with OCT, there's all these little micro fractures, which explains why the stents pop open nicely. That in a 360 degree way is a much gentler way to get an art expand as opposed to just renting one part of it with an NC balloon at 24 atmospheres. So I think a lot of what we try to do is, you know, risk of perforation is something which you want to mitigate. And probably as someone asked a little bit earlier, calcific nodules are the place where perforation is really a problem. Our stents look deformed. And at that point, if you've gotten it wrong and haven't been able to either shave or modify that nodule, taking a balloon to 22 atmospheres is when we push them through the wall and it could be a big problem. And I've gotten burned with not prepping calcific nodules well in the ostium of the LED, having a stent which I'm not proud of. And then I'm like holding my breath every time I post dilate it because I perforate there, I've just now destroyed the left main and covering the left main with covered stents and fenestrating them is a disaster. And so I like to try to be way more judicious about modify appropriately, get the stent expanded well so that my 20, so that my NC balloon at 18 atmospheres is all we need to do. You don't have to start doing all the, you got it wrong. The device I think lists for $4,700. And there's been some uh, new pathways for which hospitals are reimbursed based on whether it's an inpatient or outpatient. And so there's pass-through payments now where the hospital gets reimbursed for the device, which has only been present for the past several months. And so I think using this device in practice is nice for a couple of reasons. It's becoming cost neutral to the hospital. Um, and most importantly, I think it's going to help get better outcomes for patients. And what I'm excited about, you know, is there's a lot of hospitals that don't have access to cardiac surgery. For that reason, based on variable state regulations, don't have atherectomy in those sites, but there's still patients that need care where it's a lot easier to use a balloon than it is an atherectomy device. And especially as we see a decrement in the median number of cases that U.S. interventionists do, probably on the median number hovers somewhere around 60 or 70 in terms of number of PCIs per year, it's a lot easier to use a balloon, which we're all familiar with. And if you're sort of doing 80 cases a year in a rural area, don't have access to atherectomy, it's cool because you can start to apply a plaque modification device, which gets around all the sorts of rules about where atherectomy is available and allows you to do a good job to get lesions to expand in complex patients. Now, if you can't get the balloon there, that's an atherectomy case and that usually needs referral. But the nice part about this is ease of use and access should help to remediate what I would argue is a problem with stent failure, which is related to under expansion. So the more we image, the more we see calcium, we can apply these technologies, get bigger stents, and hopefully improve durability.